Hey, everybody, and welcome back to NetDevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston, and joining me today is Kevin Swiber. He is a solution architect with Postman, and he's here to help us all understand how we can use this wonderful tool to experiment and leverage the REST APIs in our network automation platforms. As always during today's session, if you have any questions, please use the question panel built into the webinar tool. I'll be gathering them up during Kevin's presentation, and then at the end, we'll have a bit of time for a tech chat so we can go through those questions and answers as they go in. If you're looking for the content from today's session, you'll be able to download the slides and access helpful links for learning materials, as well as code samples and other places where you can learn more and get hands on with Postman. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to get us started. Hi, thanks, everyone. Um, as Hank said, I'm Kevin Swiber uh, with Postman. Uh, I've been in the API space um, for about 10 years uh, and using APIs for, I guess, almost twice as long. So super happy to, to share some of that experience with you today. Uh, so as uh, our, our CEO and co-founder Abhinav says, every piece of software built today either uses an API or is an API. Um, if we take a look back at, at some of the history over the last 20 years even, um, we can see this, this emergence of APIs into the state they are today. Um, going back into the 90s, there's, there's early work happening um, around RPC over the network uh, that starts to morph a little bit as we hit the, the, the dot-com bubble. Um, and we see companies like eBay uh, for the first time realizing that their website goes down and transactions stop happening. Um, and so really the, this, this new generation of internet companies starts to push some concepts forward that eventually get adopted by the enterprise. Um, and we see propagate all over the place today. Um, so, you know, in, in 2002, Amazon has this mandate that says every uh, piece of data or behavior that a team creates um, within the organization needs to be exposed via some kind of service interface. Um, in 2006, we see Twitter as a public service company release its API. Uh, so, you know, the, these are sort of like early milestones that have led to today. Um, and today, I mean, I, I've worked in in um, in organizations where there are um, there are APIs running on the manufacturing floor. There are APIs running in oil rigs. Um, there are APIs, of course, running in the data center. Um, so, really, it's a it's a fairly exciting time. Um, and and certainly, that's where where Postman comes in. Uh, at Postman, we've seen uh, so these are these are numbers that we have internally um, based on on usage of of the Postman product. So in 2019, we had 4.7 billion requests come through the product, um, which is is fairly large, uh, and that that's more than 10 million users on the platform. Uh, more than 500,000 organizations are on Postman today. Um, everything from from early stage startups to large enterprises. Um, and it, it happens to be one of the largest communities of developers today. Uh, one way to look at the growth of APIs and the, the significance of APIs over the years is to look at the consumer side of things. And that's really where Postman sits as an API consumer and a tool for API um, consumers, um, at least initially. Um, we've seen some, some movement towards the producer side as well, which is good. Uh, but if we take a look at, at the number of collections that are created in Postman, um, not only is this sort of a sign of, of, of product adoption, but it, it's also an indicator of the popularity of APIs, right? So uh, fortunately, Postman was introduced at a time um, when the, the API um, craze was at, at sort of a pivot point, and, and we've seen it escalate. So... Um, Today, the, the numbers here don't really matter as much as, as sort of the curve that I'm showing, but today we're we're looking at uh, almost 35 million collections in Postman today. And as I mentioned earlier, we see this across all sorts of industries and use cases. These are all folks who, who use Postman um, that, that we know about, um, who have, have signed up for accounts. But, um, you know, it, it, it really crosses every section of business. Um, you know, I've worked in in the mortgage industry, uh, which was you know a, a fairly mid stage adopter of of APIs in various forms. Um, I've worked in in healthcare, um, you know, and and certainly being 
in a, a product-based business around APIs. We've seen um, APIs everywhere, of course, you know, retail, IoT, as I mentioned. Um, and of course, in, in sort of like lower level infrastructure stuff as well. Uh, so as we see, you know, uh, a shift or an expansion of resources moving to the cloud, uh, there's tons of tooling in there that is now API centric. Uh, and there's the sort of two sides of, of um, API lifecycle here. There's, there's the API consumer side, there's the API producer side. Um, you know, most of what we'll be looking at today is going to be on the consumer side uh, on the left, um, but the producer side is, is still fairly significant as well. Um, they, the interesting thing about these is that they, they obviously tie into each other, uh, you know, as APIs are um, designed and tested and published, um, the consumer side needs to sort of be working in tandem, right? So uh, we can take a look at, at how to do some of that stuff today, actually. Um, as the producer side is, is building and testing, how do we as consumers go in uh, and begin testing our code against that? Okay, I'm gonna run through a few demos here. Um, and I'll just give you sort of a high level overview um, right now. Um, so we're gonna take a look at the Postman product, uh, look at running requests, importing collections, um, and some of the different features around that. And then we'll come back and talk about managing workflows through that, writing tests, um, and then some of our collaboration and version control features. Let me move over to Postman. Um, so if you've used Postman before, you've seen a screen similar to this. Uh, this is sort of the launch pad that you get when, when you start up. Um, and over the years, lots of, um, you know, lots of icons have been added to the screen. Lots of options have been added as the product has expanded. But the core focus uh, has always really been about how to easily make an HTTP request over um, uh, through the Postman product. So. Um, to, to really get started with Postman, it's helpful to understand a few things about HTTP. HTTP. Um, if we take a look, typically someone will come in here and just type in a URL. We're gonna use the Postman Echo service, which is just sort of a simple test service. It's send <clears throat> and we get a response. Um, a couple of things worth noting here. Um, again, I said I've been in the HTTP space for a while, so um, you know, the, there's, a lot of nuance behind some of these. Um, every HTTP request has a method that comes along with it. Um, get, in this case, just retrieves a, a resource. Um, these different methods have different um, properties around them. Uh, so usually we talk in terms of, of safety and item potence. So safety being, uh, if this call makes a change on the server, mutates some kind of state, we'll say that that's an unsafe call. Um, and if this particular call uh, is repeatable without changing the state, um, we'll say that's an item potent call. So um, if you do sort of a little, a little research into HTTP methods, um, some of this becomes a bit clearer, but um, you know, a, a get is, is a retrieval action. It's, it's, it's safe, it's item potent. You can do it a, a bunch of times. Um, a post is is not safe. We expect some change to happen on the server, um, and and it's not item potent. So you can do multiple post requests and potentially expect different results. Um, a put request, uh, we expect some kind of change on the server, but you can do it repeatedly, right? So and most people will use this uh, for sort of a replace call. So I want to replace this particular resource with this request body. Um, <clears throat> we won't go through all of these, but uh, obviously, delete is is unsafe as well because uh, we're we're aiming to delete a resource. So some of those HTTP basics are very helpful to understand um, when using this when using any kind of HTTP client. Um, <clears throat> for us today, we'll mostly just be using GET with a little bit of POST. So um, every HTTP request obviously has a, a URL as well. Um, I usually talk about sort of three pillars of web APIs. Um, and, and URIs here, 
uniform resource indicators, or in this case, a, a URL, uniform resource locator, is is one of those pillars. So we have an identity for something out there that we're we're talking to that's represented, but that's represented by this URI. Um, HTTP is another pillar. So we talked about request methods, um, and there's a bunch more that we'll talk about around HTTP today. Uh, and the third one is, is sort of media types, uh, and for our purposes. Uh, we're going to be looking at sort of just plain JSON that we have here. Um, so walking through this a bit, we have a request. We're making a request. Um, every request can have optional query parameters. So, um, you know, we can get in there. Um, authorization, obviously very important when it comes to APIs and making API calls. There are several different options we can, we can do here. We won't go through all of them. Um, uh, basic auth can be common, though many things are moving over to OAuth 2. Um, here in the in the request portion that we're looking at right now, we can set request headers uh, or a request body as well, which we won't have on a, a GET request, but we'll look at some of that a little bit later. Um, and while we won't dive too deep into this right now, it's it's, uh, it's worth it to, to mention and touch on. Um, Postman has a concept of scripting that's built into it. For, for various automation tasks. Um, there's an opportunity to do some initial setup before a request goes out, and that would happen in a pre-request script. Um, Test allows you to actually make assertions against the response that you're getting. Uh, it also adds an opportunity to add some, some post response uh, functionality as well that we'll look at. Um, and of course, settings are, are sort of per request here. Um, and that there's a few things in here, but Mostly, we'll, we'll just leave the default settings. Um, so other things sort of in this request screen worth looking at, uh, there's cookies if you're using cookies. A lot of times in, in REST APIs, we don't. Uh, but there are definitely a lot out there that, that will. Um, so it's good to have that option. Um, one really interesting part, one really handy part of Postman, I think, is our code generation opportunities. So um, if we click this code link over here, uh, you can see that there's a number of different uh, libraries and formats that we can we can pull snippets from. Um, everything from raw HTTP to using curl on the command line, um, you know, JavaScript, PHP, Python. And this allows us to very easily just come in here and do a copy, paste it into our IDE, uh, and start making requests. Uh, if we scroll down and look at our response pane, um, a couple of different options for for looking at the the response. We're using sort of a prettified version of our JSON response. Um, again, various response headers um, that we can take a look at, and then there's test results, which we'll get to uh, as well. Um, Actually, a, a fairly cool feature is this save response option. So you can either save this to a file or save it as an example. We'll look at how that could be beneficial uh, in a bit. Um, so th that's sort of an overview of, of some basic request functionality. Uh, when fairly early on in Postman, uh, we realized that um, the requests are great. It's great to, to have all this functionality at the request level. Um, what happens when we have a bunch of these? What happens when we have an API that we want to to model, uh, to share? Um, and and the solution to that was to to create a container for for a bunch of requests in something called collections. Um, and we'll see that collections is now sort of uh, the the primary unit of work within Postman in general. Uh, so if we take a look at the sidebar over here, there's a collections tab and go to a new collection. We'll just take a look at, at some of these. Um, descriptions are possible for each collection, uh, and we'll see this in a number of different places in Postman. Uh, each of these will dis will support Markdown, uh, and this feeds into documentation, actually, which we'll take a look at. Authorization can be set at the collection level as well and then inherited by those uh, requests that are a part of it. Um, again, we have pre-request and test scripts uh, that can sit at the collection level um, and variables, which we'll also get into. Uh, if we hit this new orange button over here, uh, we can see a, a few of the different entities that are possible to be created within Postman. Uh, again, we talked about requests and collections. 
Um, environments are, are a handy use of, of storing variables and sharing those between collections. Um, uh, there's API documentation, mock servers, monitoring, uh, a, a fairly new concept that we have called APIs, which bundles a bunch of these resources together. Um, we have the idea of an API network. Uh, you can see that Cisco DevNet is, is a featured partner here on our API network. Um, th these are going to be bundles of sort of like curated APIs curated by the API producer um, and offered over our network. For now, we're going to pull in a template called Postman Echo. We'll hit this Run in Postman button. And then we'll import it over here. You'll see that it has 37 requests. Collections have uh, the opportunity to add folders as well um, for, for further organization. Um, if I mentioned, so we can come in here and take a look at some of this. I mentioned that um, documentation was was an option. So we'll, we'll see that uh, this collection has um, a description associated with it. Um, this request has a description associated with it. So if we hit uh, this arrow over here and view in web, we can actually see the documentation that's generated by all of this. Um, and this is something that can be shared within your team as well. Um, well, once here, there's also editing features, uh, commenting features. There's this goes quite a bit deeper, but again, our our home base is is always collections. So uh, we talked a little bit about why you might want to use a collection, um, organization, documentation, um, test suites, and conditional workflows. Uh, we'll we'll actually run through what test suites and conditional workflows might look like as well. Uh, I think that's actually our second demo. All right, so we'll, we'll take a look. Now that we have a collection, what do we do with this collection? Um, how, do we, how do we execute conditional logic? Um, how do we um, put things into a collection run to, to run multiple requests at a time? Um, and then how do we make assertions against what we're getting back? Great. So um, first, let's let's start talking about tests. Um, why might you want to test? Uh, some tests are are very basic. Like I want to make sure that the schema I'm getting back from this API call matches what I expect. Uh, especially if I'm writing from a, a consumer perspective, I'm writing an HTTP client that's going to speak to this server. Um, I want to make sure that the response I'm getting back is something I can actually work with, uh, something I'm expecting to work with. So uh, we'll see in this request, there's already a few tests that are happening. If we look at the response pane down here, we can see that test results are running uh, with, with each request execution. Um, we'll see here that uh, there are certain things like making sure that the status is a 200, um, making sure that the uh, the response has some expectations there. So um, we're actually going to go through this and, and write a small script just to give an idea of, of what that might look like. So um, earlier we had a request where uh, we had foo equals five here. Uh, as part of this echo service, we take a look at the response body. We can see that these query params end up coming back in the body in this JSON response. Um, and that's buried under args, and in this case, foo is five. So we can make an assertion that says, um, you know, I want to ensure that, that foo equals five from the response body. Uh, this place where we're writing the scripts is called the Postman sandbox. Uh, it's executed in, in sort of an isolated environment here, um, and it's fed certain functionality. So. PM is, is a way to access certain functionality in that Postman sandbox. PM.test um, you know, states this is a test that we want to execute and, and look at our results in, in, in our test results. Um, so we, we start by writing a test. We can have a variable here called body that pulls in the response and converts that to JSON, because we know it's JSON. Um, and then we can have certain expectations. Um, 
this expect syntax is coming from um, a library called chai.js that has uh, a number of different features associated with it. We do have some documentation uh, in the Postman Learning Center, but the documentation is, is a lot more complete on Chai's official website. Uh, so we can say pm.expect uh, body.args.foo to equal five. Um, and so this, this is some of the, the Chai syntax. Um, again, setting this expectation, saying we want from our body args.foo to equal five. We can run that. Oh, we actually see we have a, a test failure here. Um, assertion error expected five as a string to equal the number five. Uh, so using some, some JavaScript here, we can use a parse int function on this to turn it from a string to a number. And then we see that pass. Um, other than sort of schema validation like this, there's um, conditional validation that can happen as well. Um, and, you know, while some of this uh, in complex scenarios can be fairly easy to automate by sort of feeding in a schema and saying, make sure the schema matches this body, the conditional stuff still often requires a bit of programming. Um, so we can say, um, let's do when... Uh, we'll say when foo equals five, we expect um, another uh, property called bar uh, to equal hello world. Um, so we'll say something like bar is present when foo is five. So again, we'll grab the body. Uh, and we'll get foo again. We'll say if foo exists and foo equals five, set an expectation on body.args.bar to equal hello world. So if we run this now, we should see it fail since we don't have bar. Um, obviously, bar is, is not in the body, and we didn't pass it in to the query string to echo out. We do it again, we'll see that that test is passed. Um, scripting can can get um, you know a, a bit more complicated than this. Um, for example, what if we want to take a value coming back from this response and feed it into a new request? Um, we can actually go through and let me make a new folder here under the collection. And we'll save this into DevNet. Great. Um, and then I'll just duplicate a post request and pass that into here. Great. So what if we want to take the value of bar and from this get request and post it in a subsequent request. Um, this is actually where variables come in handy. Um, we have variables at various layers here. Um, there's variables you can set on the collection. There are global variables that you can set within your, your Postman instance. Um, and then there are environment variables. Um, when it comes to sharing out collections, um, a lot of times there are variables that will live at the environment level. You could think of it in terms of like API keys and, and security, but it's more than just security. Um, a lot of things might depend on that specific execution environment. Uh, and, and so that's where the environment comes into play. Um, we saw when we looked at the details of a collection, there's a variable section. Uh, if we look at the top right over here, we see that there's also a concept of environments. Um, if we hit this little cog, we can manage environments, add a new one, we'll say devnet, uh, and we'll have a variable here called bar. Um, and we're gonna actually set this programmatically. Uh, so we've come back to our request. Um, we can do pm dot, um, 
pm dot variables dot set or um, body dot args. That's it. Let's see. Doing that? Oh, oh, okay. Obviously, let's see. Let's grab this. We want to set our body. Set our environment. Always important to remember to set your environment here. And let's see. All right. Um, one handy thing over here is the sort of the snippets that we can do to get you started. Um, so you can see I was actually using the ron um, the ron variables collection here. So if I go to pm .environment .set, I can set that to bar. And then set this. Now let's try that again. If that looks like it passes. If we look at our, our DevNet environment, uh, we should have a variable here bar with the value hello world. So again, this is um, a way to hold values, hold data as we work through various flows. Um, we moved this post request over as well to our DevNet folder. Um, so we can do things like go to the request body. Uh, we'll set this as JSON. Uh, uh, now what this request will do, we'll take the body and it'll echo it back uh, from the request to the response. R. There's a, a variable interpolation syntax here that can work um, through various parts of our, our request. Um, in this case, we're, we're saying we want to insert the bar variable. Um, and this will actually look at the different scopes that we talked about and find like what is the, the topmost bar and put that in there. If we send that request along, um, we should be able to see in the response we have data bar hello world. So that went through successfully. Um, we very quickly jump over to the Postman Learning Center and look at the docs. Uh, to learn more about this, um, we can go uh, into variables and environments and using variables. Um, and again, in here, uh, there should be something about variable scoping that we mentioned. Um, and it, it'll kind of show you like, you know, which takes precedence, um, environment, collection, uh, global. Um, here we go. Uh, there's a concept of local. There's a concept of iteration data that we'll, we'll briefly touch on. Uh, environment, collection, global. So many different places to set variables. Um, now that we have sort of a, a, a small workflow going here, we can actually come through and hit uh, this collection details button um, and click run. And this will open up our collection runner. Uh, and so through the collection runner, you can actually run the entire collection. Uh, it'll execute all of the tests and give you a report back. Um, or you can go through and select um, a folder, select individual request. We're going to select our DevNet folder that we created. Um, a few different options here, an environment that you want to pick. We want this DevNet environment that we set up that has that, that bar variable. You can actually have it run multiple iterations with a delay in between. Um, and I mentioned that, that data scope for variables. That data scope for variables um, can come from iteration data. And so say you have a, a CSV file um, you know, with a bunch of, of sample data that you want to run through. This is where you would feed it in. Um, we want to keep our variable values, uh, and we'll, we'll run this. OK. We'll see that the test associated with each of these requests has run. Um, we have a run summary. We can actually export these results. Um, and beyond that, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to be able to do this within Postman. Um, but there's some automation opportunity here as well. And for that, we have a CLI tool called Newman. 
Um, and we won't go we won't go deep on Newman, but you can take a look at it uh, and you know see how people are using it as a CLI. They're using it in CI/CD pipelines. Um, it, it, at its core, it's basically just a way to run collections. So you can set an environment to it. You can set global variables to it. Uh, you point it to a collection and say, okay, execute that and give me the results. And there's number a number of different reporters that come back or that are available. Um, you can get a response in HTML. Um, you can get a response, um, you know, in, in JSON format, uh, and the reporters are actually, actually extensible. And so there's there's some extra ones out there. There's one that that creates something for Confluence, perhaps. Um, so something worth looking into if you're doing some automation around collection runs. Okay. So I think that concludes our second demo. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, collaboration and version control. So, you know, say you're you're starting to do some of this, you're starting to play around with some collections, you've got some perhaps some documentation uh, that you want to share. Um, how do we how do we collaborate around this? Um, how do we communicate around these different assets? Um, so let me close the collection runner here. Uh, well, I guess one of the first things worth mentioning is that collections are shareable. So uh, every collection, if you hit the ellipsis here for, for more actions, you can go to share collection. Um, you can share it in a workspace, which is a, a, a container of work that, that houses collections and environments um, and other assets as well. Um, you can actually embed it. We clicked that run and postman button earlier. You can actually put that on a website and say, hey, click this and it'll actually open the collection in Postman. Um, or you can get a public link and share that out as well. Um, workspaces um, can be either team or personal. So every account on Postman comes with a, a personal workspace. Um, when you start expanding into a team, uh, that team itself can start owning workspaces that you can share among different team members. So if we were to create new, um, add a name, we can select team or personal. And once you're actually in a team, um, you can invite specific people to this particular workspace. Um, by default, everyone in the team can view and join as a collaborator. You can change that to an administrator so they can actually make, make changes just about everywhere. Um, or you can say, I don't want this to be shown to the rest of my team. I want this to be a private workspace shared only with the people uh, who I've explicitly invited. Um, so beyond that, there's also um, this, this cool activity feed that you can go in through and, and see who on your team has made updates recently. You can see Ken Lane has done something. Trey has done something. Um, there's uh, there's a concept of roles as well. We won't get into, but you can set you know various roles um, for for editing, for access, administration, um, and actually a, a cool feature that I like is if you're on a team, you're sharing things, you want to make changes. Um, you can come through here uh, and actually create a fork of collections. Um, and fork that into a particular workspace. So you can actually fork into your own personal workspace if you want. And what this fork will do will allow you, again, to make those changes independent of, of what's upstream here. So you're not impacting everyone else. Um, so say we wanted to add another request. We'll add another request here. We'll we'll save it. We can come through, uh, and then there's a couple of things we can do. We can just say we want to merge these changes, or we can create a pull request. Uh, and what this pull request will allow is for other folks on the team to actually go through and um, review what the changes are. Um, add request to DevNet. You can select a reviewer. Uh, and then take a look at the changes. So, um, what's um, so every collection actually has a, a JSON representation to it, uh, which allows us to do things like sharing. You can export a collection to a JSON file and share that. Um, 
And so you can actually put collection files into your, your source control repository. So you can do diffs on collections. Um, that can actually be a little bit cumbersome because as, as we've seen, there's a lot that can go into a collection. Uh, one benefit of using this model here of, of going through Postman and doing forks and merges and pull requests is that we get semantic diffing. So we can take a look and see that, oh, a new request was added in this case, right? Um, and see that, oh yeah, tests have changed um, and the body has changed and the description has changed instead of looking at uh, a, a diff of, of JSON changes. Um, so this actually ends up being very handy. You can create pull requests again, we, um, and that, that's for review. You can also just come in and say, okay, now that I'm done here, I wanna merge these changes. So this is actually um, a very powerful piece of, of doing team workflows. Um, come through, we can see that that request is propagated over to the original collection, so. I guess one last thing to mention is that um, there are, there's the ability to, to add comments as well. Um, this is, again, another collaboration feature. So comments can happen on the request level. Um, you can do tagging of folks to give them notifications. Um, if we, we looked at documentation earlier, if we go to, to view this on the web again, we can see that comments can be made on various sections um, here in the, in the documentation as well. Um, so as you go through the product, you'll you'll see these little comment boxes. Uh, and again, this this is to add this, this sort of team collaboration around every aspect of your API or an API that you're working with. Um, so yeah, we've, we've seen, let me hit play here. We've seen a couple of different aspects that we've gone through today of, of Postman and the API platform that's provided. Uh, we've touched on a few of these things. There's, there's a lot more. One, very deceptive thing I think is is that you you start Postman perhaps not deceptive but um, surprising is that you could start Postman working with just a plain request um, and as your needs grow um, there are actually features there to support those needs um, so you know oftentimes we have folks who are using the product who are using requests and collections um, getting all of their needs met doing that um, and then you know, suddenly realizing that even though they're they're they feel like they're a power user, there's actually a lot more involved. Um, we we didn't touch on things like like mocking, um, saving examples, uh, monitoring. There's there's a lot more here. Um, and so to to further that education and, and and get some support, Postman has a learning center that we looked at the docs a little bit. Um, there there's a lot there. Um, there's also our community forum at community.postman.com, which is fairly active. We monitor that ourselves from Postman, and we also have lots of community participation there. Um, so you'll see folks from the community actually answering questions in addition to asking questions. Um, we have a YouTube channel um, with a bunch of different videos on there for uh, teaching how to use the product. Um, here we see in this particular screenshot, it's showcasing uh, the Postman visualizer. So in that case, you can make a request, get a response, and turn that response into something more visual you can work with, like graphs or charts. Um, and, and that's particularly handy, so you can find more information there. Uh, we've just started a Twitch stream uh, with Joyce and Arlemy from our team. Um, it's going really well. Uh, it's interesting to watch people go through and interact with APIs and hit problems uh, and solve them in real time. Uh, any questions after this, you can always feel free to reach out to me personally on Twitter at Kevin Swiber or um, Postman directly at Get Postman. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to hand this back over to Hank. Excellent. Great job, Kevin. That was really helpful. Um, one of the things I liked the most about the presentation was seeing an expert in Postman highlight the things that you see as valuable. Um, one of the things we've done in DevNet for a good long time is every time we teach a, a REST API for one of our network platforms, um, Postman's always been our go-to. <clears throat> 
And so I've been using Postman for a long time. Um, back in the days when it was still like a Chrome web app was kind of when we first started using it and, and going through. But there's all of these, these new pits. And one of the ones I wanted to talk a bit about was the sharing of collections. And so I, I write labs, um, we do video lessons on how to use things. And my, my go-to model for sharing a collection out has always been to kind of like export the JSON and then include it in a Git repository. And that, con that, that piece you showed of like providing a URL and all those other ones, how does that work? Like I, I picture the collection like exists on my my laptop and my or in my client that's um that's there. But but where when I share it off through the system, like where's it all coming from? Is it just included with, with the Postman account? Like where are these all being stored? Yeah. So when you have a Postman account, uh, everything that you're working on gets synced with the, our cloud. So um, you know which, which is great. So you can switch computers and then still get all of your your collections right. Uh, but it also allows for things like um, uh, the run and postman button that we saw. So essentially, mm -hmm. that's a way to to embed that sharing experience. Um, and again, as you mentioned, that public link is going to point to that collection representation in the cloud. Awesome. So that's that's nice. And so if we if we give the links out, and then we as we update our collections, people that are using those links are, are they kept in sync? So if someone were to import a collection from me using my link. And I make changes. Does it is it like a at that point a shared collaborated collection, or would they have to go re-import it? No, kind of by design, that link is going to point to that collection at that moment in time um, mm -hmm. to to sort of prevent drift, right? Um, mm -hmm. For like a, a real collaborative experience like that, it's helpful to have folks on the same team within Postman uh, being able to use the uh, the fork and merge and pull request features that I showed um, before. So, uh, and again, you can certainly do this through Git and JSON files. So again, that semantic diff experience that's offered through Postman is a lot nicer than going through and saying, oh, like these two JSON fields changed, like what happened here? Yeah. And that, that was one of the ones that I did like. So on that, um, I think a lot of a lot of folks probably use the personal or the free account from Postman as it goes in. And one of the things I was trying to figure out is of your demo, particularly around some of that collaboration and the, the forking and the merging, are those features that come in when you move to like a team account in Postman? Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm I'm not sure how deep that goes. You can have a free team. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what the, the different governance or limits are on there, um, but you should be able to do everything I showed with a free team today. Okay. Uh, you can take a look at the Postman plans and pricing page to, to get a sense of, of what the various pay tiers would offer on top of that. Yeah, I definitely want to look at that because it was one of the, as you were going through the the sharing and updating, I was like, well, why, why wouldn't I just store this off in, in our GitLab instance that we we host internally for our systems or some of our public repos are in GitHub. And then that semantic diff where I was like, that's that's the reason, like being able to have the context around what changed was, was huge for those. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that I was trying to go through, and may, maybe you can help, I've often used environment variables. And so I often will set up an, uh, an environment and then fill that with, an, with all the variables and pieces that are there. And I don't use collection variables very much. When you, when you work with folks, how do you recommend to somebody what to make an environment variable versus a collection variable? And then somewhat related, I am still get confused on the whole initial value versus current value with variables and, and trying to track what, do you, what should I set if I'm trying to set the value of something? Yeah, so um, to, to answer your first question between collection variables and environment variables, um, a, again, we usually say things like like API keys and security related stuff should go into an, in the environment and not on the collection, particularly because collections get shared a lot more than environments. Um, and those things will change uh, depending on who the actual user is, right? So um, that, that actually that last bit, depending on who the user is, if, if you have a value that changes depending on the consumer, then that probably belongs in an environment, not on the collection level. Um, there are certain uh, workflow things that you can do that make sense to have on the collection level. Um, for instance, we have um, sort of an advanced ability to um, pull in any node module and use a node module in scripting. And we sort of store a representation of that node module in collection variables. Um, that's something that might make sense to live on the collection side because it's not going to change between every single user. And there's actually a little bit of overhead in acquiring that. So if we can save that on the collection level, share that collection out, it saves time for, for other folks who are actually going to use it. Um, so on collection and um, 
environment variables, you mentioned there's this this option of, of um, current versus initial value. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go through the um, the preferences in Postman, you'll see um, uh, an option there that says something like persist uh, variables by default. Um, a lot of times, folks want to will want to shut that off, um, especially when we're talking about the environment side, uh, because what that means when that's on and is on by default is that um, the last value that you set for that particular variable gets synced with the server. Right, so mm -hmm. the updating the current value will actually update that initial value, um, and so if you're working with API keys or something like that, you definitely don't want to be persisting um, that to the cloud. Right, so uh, the initial is going to be like, what do you start with? And if it's something that is a secret, it'll typically be like a placeholder that says like, hey, this is a secret. Um, and the current again is is what you're actively using. So we saw that uh, in my demo, I set an environment variable in a script that would update the current value. Um, if that sync option was on, it would also then go ahead and update the initial value. So that 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 section in preferences is important to look at. Ah. So so if, so when I'm using tests to update values and environment variables, like a, a cookie or a, a, a token or something that came back or UUID, the value that the test is updating is always the current value it's never going to go through an update. And the only way to update the initial value is, is it that persist function? Yes. So either you can, you can have the option on to say persist by default, which it is, it is on um, by default, mm -hmm. or you can manually go through and hit a persist link that's in there. Um, so typically I turn that option off uh, in, in the general settings. And for those variables that, or those values that I do want to persist back, I'll go through and I'll, I'll hit persist. Okay. Um, yeah, just just um, from a, I guess I'm a little bit more paranoid on the security side, so that that makes me feel better. No, nothing wrong with some some security <laughs> paranoia. Um, we had a couple of questions coming in through the, from the audience, and this was an sure. interesting one. That that Newman CLI tool was a new one for me as well. Someone commented that it's the coolest name ever. I, I got to get with that one. That's definitely <laughs> a nice one to pop up. Um, someone asked, is it possible to run just one request in a collection using the CLI? And I can't remember if you covered that in the demo piece or not, but if I want to use Newman, can I target in on just a single request or is it going to run an entire collection? Mm, on the CLI, um, I'd have to double check, but I, I recall it only working on uh, a folder level, not necessarily the request level. So you can say, I want to run the entire collection. You can say, I want to run these folders in the collection. Um, and I think that's as deep as it goes on the CLI side. I believe in the UI, you can select a single request and say, hey, I want to run this single request. Um, but, you know, again, the the idea behind the collection runner behind Newman is that typically I want to run a set of requests, right? There's some kind of workflow that I'm executing here. Um, so often that that ends up being more than one request. Sure. Um, there might there might be a way to do it with Newman, um, and I, I just don't know about it. But um, yes. going to you know GitHub.com slash Postman Lab slash Newman, um, I would file a, a, an issue there, um, and it's pretty heavily managed. So somebody will get back. Okay, awesome. Now I, th I think we have to spend a little bit of time talking about the whole um, scripting inside a Postman. Um, there was a question that came through pre request scripts and testing. Uh, is it a separate ecosystem of libraries? Can you import some some known testing framework? Um, we do a lot of conversations around things like robot and then there's um, PyTest and PyATS, which are Python testing frameworks for the network. I know Postman is is JavaScript basis. And so that's that that's an area where network engineers like myself have to kind of get ourselves to. Um, any suggestions on for somebody that may be fairly new to development and scripting and coding at all, but most of the time has been spent kind of in the Python world? Um, we've got some of the links that have shared in there, but is there is there a can you help us dispel the fear a little bit of I got to go learn JavaScript um, now in addition to Python and then maybe PowerShell or something else that they're trying to figure out? Yeah. So uh, the good news about JavaScript, in, in my opinion, anyway, is that it, it feels very much like a scripting language, right? It feels very much, it has kind of a similar feel to it as like writing Bash script, like writing Python. Um, you know, things are kind of dynamic. Um, you can make little tiny scripts. Uh, but also, like, it can also explode into this really large, complex application that you can build, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of, of the scripts in Postman as being 
more towards that 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 scripting side that you know sort of um less heavily managed like less um you know less application architecture around it right it's it's more of just a script i think it's a little easier to to get started um there's plenty of resources out there and learning uh javascript node school is is a fairly good one um and of course many more more courses out there um uh the with Node.js being so popular and, and, and really Postman uses Node.js, just sort of kind of a sandbox version of it to run your scripts. Um, it's easier now than ever to just go and, and run and start, like pull down Node, make a couple scripts, run them and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would recommend just, just playing around. I mean, it's how I learned best anyway, is just getting my hands dirty and, and, and playing around with those things. Looking at some examples that are out there and starting from that is also probably very helpful. Um, for Postman, we have mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of examples. We saw that there are, um, when you hit that new button, there are templates out there for various collections. A lot of those collections are actually teaching how to use scripts within Postman. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll see things like, how do we have variables on you know multiple iterations of a collection run? Things like that. Um, so the, there are resources within Postman to go do that as well. If you go through the Postman docs, you can see some built-in libraries that are there. So we'll have things for like scraping HTML, um, you know, doing schema validation for JSON. Um, this is stuff that that's sort of built in. Uh, I mentioned a way to sort of go out and fetch more um, JavaScript libraries from NPM. Um, that's that's kind of more on the advanced side. But that there's a lot that can be done just with what's out of the box. So hmm. um, I would take a look there first, always, and then if um, you know the if, if there is a barrier and you do need to pull in another testing framework or something that that you would typically use, um, I would take a look at um, there's a, a template out there called Browserify CDN. So B R O W S E R I F Y. Um, and that template shows how to pull in modules from NPM. So you can pull in testing frameworks, you can pull in utility libraries, anything. Sure. And I think that it, it definitely gives me an idea that that's an area where um, we in DevNet can probably help with our specific audience of network engineers that are out there, maybe write a couple of our learning labs to kind of show good use cases and build some tests around some of our network automation APIs that are there. So for those listening uh, here, look for that. I'll see if we I can I can uh, wrangle one of our engineers up to go write us uh, some pieces. Because we do have a handful of folks that are pretty good in the JavaScript land um, because it's much more heavy in the collaboration world than in the infrastructure network engineering spot. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, uh, one last question, and then we're going to kind of close down because the time has flown by. Um, there was a question about future plans for Postman to have a Mac OS app. Now, I know that it already does have a Mac OS app because I run it on my my laptop that's there, but there was a question about um, using Postman from a web browser and other pieces. Which So the, the way I'm going to phrase it to you is, which platforms can I run Postman on? Like, where is Postman available? And there, it used to be the first place I used Postman was when it was an app for Chrome. And then with Google changing the capabilities that were there, it kind of went away. Um, is there a, a web web enabled version of Postman that may be out there that I haven't seen? Or is that something that the team is looking at to kind of make it so it's available without having to install a full application? Yeah, so Postman started as a Chrome extension, as you mentioned, so back in 2012. Um, and, and today, due to some changes, we are starting to deprecate that. So um, right now, the, the way to get Postman is running as um, a native app on Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, we are right now experimenting with uh, something we're calling Project Artemis to run this in the web as well. So I mentioned that all of this stuff actually gets synced with our cloud, assuming you have an account. Um, you know, so in our, in our hopefully near future, we'll be able to log into uh, the Postman dashboard and be able to go through our collections and execute that stuff right, right in the web without having to have any downloaded app experience. Fantastic. All right. So we'll have to all look for that as it comes through. Yeah. All right. We are at the top of the hour here. Any final thoughts for our audience today, Kevin? I just thank you so much for having me. Um, I love working with APIs, uh, so that, that's why I work at Postman. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions about doing that going forward. Um, thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again on behalf of our entire community. I'm going to go ahead and get myself set up so that we can close ourselves down. All right, everybody. We have come to the end of another episode here of NetDevOps Live, um, but we are, are certainly not done with our discussions on Postman. 
Um, as mentioned, we've got the slides that Kevin went through as well as links to learning labs, code samples, um, a few videos and pieces that are there, some of the ones from Postman's resources, as well as links back to some of the resources we have up on DevNet as well. So please check out the webinar resources for today's episode to find access to all of those details. Now, you, you knew it was coming, our code exchange challenge. Uh, NetDevOps Live is not just about listening to other people code, but also getting out there and using these skills yourself. So let's everybody pick your favorite Cisco REST API and then go build and share a Postman collection. Uh, make sure to include some gits and posts and deletes. Um, we've got so many REST APIs in the, in the DevNet family. Maybe you're an enterprise networking guy, go tackle the, the programmability capabilities of DNA Center. Or maybe you're a data center focused, ACI has long had a REST API that's there. And a new tool and platform that I've recently started playing with and I'm really enjoying is the whole SD-WAN ecosystem and the vManage APIs. So pick one of those, write it, uh, build a collection and share it with the community, um, have, help everybody out as it goes in. Now, if you are looking for more information about NetDevOps in general, we have a ton of great resources. We've got the homepage for NetDevOps, developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps, or then add a slash live to view all of the NetDevOps live episodes that are there. We are in our third season, so we have tons of material that you can binge to catch up on all of the great topics and programmability. Now, be sure to join us next week. We're coming to the end, but we're not quite there yet. So we've got episode uh, six next week when Jeremy Stretch from Network to Code is going to join me to talk about NetBox and Source of Truth. And, and who would have thought I'd have been this excited to just talk about IP address management and uh, data center infrastructure management. But they really are core to enterprise grade kind of automation strategies. This is definitely one you don't want to miss. And if you do have more questions, be sure to stay in touch with all of us. You can find me at hapresto at cisco.com, both WebEx Teams and email. And I'm HF Preston up on Twitter. And then be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. At Cisco DevNet will find you on Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and all of the places that are there. With that, thank you so much again for joining us for today's episode. And we will see you next time. Talk soon.